Nation Records, 360 Arm, y'all, Rastafari. You already know what time it is, time to redeem the time. Praise up that shit back. Living in a world full of zombies, they walking dead Dumb, deaf, and blind, Gentile Babylonians I and I have been quickened Redeemed by the Most High, filled with the Spirit In the new name I walk now Tamud Rastafari, till I see on top now I reap and I sow good fruit Trample Babylon under I timbal and boot Fast and pray Idol liberty, Negus, Neges, Selassie, Rastafari Studying the Holy Scripture, learn the half of the story That they failed to reveal to us Babylon resistance is useless Rastafari remain the crown holder regardless Label me a conscious artist Because I remain in the truth and in who's in control of all of this As we walk and stumble through these valleys and these shadows Must remain focused on the spiritual battle Led like sheep to the starter like cattle Never realizing that you're a divine animal Imagine if everything you thought became tangible Your hardships manageable We living with the sickness And Jah is the antidote Prescriptions and scriptures Word, sound, power, Rastafari Alright, so again, a shalom and a salam to this is Lejefti Rashivdeya, Johannes Wilde Amanuel, Rastafari Renaissance.com. And so here I really would seek to expound again on the significance of the black Americans or the Negroes or the African Americans here in the Western Hemisphere and their connection, their bond, their solidarity. You know, and uh, for many of us here on these shores, our own spiritual, physical, and genetic connection to Ethiopia, you know, in a holistic sense. You know, I tend to speak on these terms and these topics and these subjects in a manner, and I'm sure that it's not completely received in a holistic perspective because I, you know, I, I tend to glance over my own comments at certain points, you know, just to you know, take a pulse on how the things I'm saying are being received. And, you know, I understand that there will be a lot of dissonance in a cognitive sense to a lot of the things that I may bring forward because it's just not common knowledge that these things that I speak of here, maybe other ones of my own uh, perspective group or my own um, initial circle tend to lean toward it's not something that is uh, easily accessible as well it takes a lot of research takes a lot of time takes a lot of energy to find a lot of these things because so much of it has been suppressed and i'm sure that a lot of the reasons for that being play in a heavy role and a heavy factor into why that is but uh, even so, I'm sure that a lot of those notions, those thoughts will come to many people's minds if they're able to check out this vid, you know, and really kind of research for themselves. But here's so, I have to, again, make a lot of disclaimers and a lot of instances just to show this in the fact that there was a heavy Afro-American Ethiopian connection much, much before 1930, even so before Marcus Garvey had come to the States and said the emphatic speeches that he, of course, made there in Harlem. You know, again, uh, Harlem itself was a Renaissance period, a rebuilding period for Afro-Americans here on these shores. And again, I have to keep pointing these things out because they're not readily or easily accessible and if we were to bring these things out in a public forum ones would of course you know try to discredit us in a certain manner so we have to come with certain references certain uh, factual statements certain quotes certain um, you know just overall <laughs> you know unknown research that is not um in the sphere of one's thinking or even on certain one's radar because it's just not something that you can just, you know, walk outside of your door and find. 
with ease of access. So here, just uh, bringing this to the forefront here of the Chicago Sunday Tribune, as we mentioned, April 21st, just this, uh, a few days ago, just passing here, we celebrated Groundation Day amongst Rastafari, just to share that with ones and uh, give a little snapshot. It was the visitation of Kedemawe Hale Selassie, or Emperor Hale Selassie I, there to Jamaica upon leaving Trinidad and Tobago on a official diplomatic visit. This was uh, all a part of our emperor, our great emperor's uh, world tour at that point and uh, other matters of diplomacy which he had sought to make those uh, lines of ascension and keep those lines of communication open to those of us in the diaspora there in Latin America, Europe, as well as here on these shores in the Caribbean and the North American continent. But here in the Chicago Sunday Tribune, uh, dated here from June 20th, 1954, we have the title of the write-up here by a Roy Otley, titled, Negroes Hail Ethiopia Emperor. And the superscription here reads, Exhibit Feeling of Bond Between Two Nations. And here I'll get into the reading, so I'll just bear with I for the entirety because it will be very elaborate and it will be very detailed about the happenings of His Majesty's visit to America in 1954 with certain ones of his families, i.e. his granddaughter and as well as a few grandsons and children, and of course, the Ethiopian consort, the Empress Itegemen and Asfau. So here, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, received a thunderous ovation from Negroes in America. The demonstrations were especially significant in Chicago, New York, and Washington, a fact which serves to highlight the meaning of race in today's world. On the South Side, speaking of Chicago, adults and children waved the red, green, and gold flags of Ethiopia and screamed their best wishes to him. Some even had a few signs in Amharic the emperor's native tongue. In Washington, where a third of the population is Negro, shouting thousands greeted him at the airport and he received an honorary degree from Howard University, a Negro institution. Prepare for reception. Men and women in Harlem stood packed to the curbs as the emperor toured the Negro neighborhood. Many leaned out of the windows and cheered the motorized procession of the conquering Lion of Judah. Everywhere, hours before he arrived, preparations had been underway for his reception. Placards with his portrait had been placed on loft buildings and tenements, and wooden horses were set up along the curbs. Thousands were in the sun early, many under parasols as police reinforcements took up their stations along the procession route. There was a nice diplomatic touch in Harlem. The emperor was taken to the Abyssinian Baptist Church, whose minister is the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, a member of the House of Representatives. The church was founded in 1808 by Ethiopian settlers who resented 
being segregated in the white churches of the city. His tours of Negro communities were the most hectic phase of the emperor's crowded schedule and he recognized racial loyalties. During the Howard University ceremonies, he made this observation about the Supreme Court decision outlawing segregated education. Events in recent days here in the United States have brilliantly confirmed before the world the contributions you have made to the principle that all men are brothers and equal in the sight of God. Publisher sits with Princess. His granddaughter, was no less inquisitive about racial developments when she was in Chicago. John H. Sinstack, editor and publisher of the Chicago Defender, sat alongside the princess Sebla Desta at the luncheon given at the Sherman Hotel by the Association of Commerce in honor of the monarch. The concern of Negroes in America about Ethiopia developed in the winter of 1935 with fascist Italy's assault upon that country. But rumors that the Ethiopians were not racially Negroes threatened the unity of Negroes in this country with those in Selassie's nation. When Dr. Malaku Bayan, a native Ethiopian, arrived in this country in 1936 as the emperor's official representative, he attempted to counteract such propaganda with the explanation that the Ethiopians reject the term Negro because of its connotation of slavery. Dr. Bayan himself was a distinctly Negroid type, and he assured Negroes that Ethiopian rejection of the term Negro did not prevent Ethiopians from aligning themselves with American Negroes in blood brotherhood because of common ancestry. Only black sovereigns. This statement was wholly reassuring to Negroes in this country and was supported by Negro scholars. They reported after a trip abroad, the emperor is very conscious of the fact that he is today the only black sovereign in the world. And he considers himself as the natural leader of the Negro race. He is fond of repeating the phrase that Ethiopia is the trustee for the future of the black races. The fact is, Ethiopians think of themselves as a non-white nation, not as a race. But Negroes in the United States feel a distinct pride in the existence of a black nation with a black monarch and thus share the luxury of racial identification.